Welcome back to another episode of Profitless on Purpose, the nonprofit accounting focused podcast. Uh, and not just from one accountant, but three very capable accountants. I'm one of your hosts, AJ Wheeler. And with me this week, I have Tammy Haas. Hi. And Mark Paladin. Hey there. Great episode this week. We got an article on uh, recalibrating how you think about grants. Are they as horrible as we think for fundraising purposes? We'll find out. We have some opinions about it. Surprise, surprise. Also, storytelling, how to build trust in your nonprofit through storytelling. Is it a really effective way to bring in donations and and community support? We'll dive into it. And then digitally tracking restricted donations. Coming into vogue, it's probably right around the corner. Is it a good idea? Sounds like it on the surface, but we'll we'll explore deeper why it might not be. So that comes up later in the episode. And this week, a capital campaign budget. What it is, how to construct it, what are we looking at when we're talking about a capital campaign? We'll get all into that and much more. But uh, this week's episode starts with Mark. Do you have a article for us? You bet. Uh, This one's called Recalibrating How You Think About Grants. Um, This is an interesting article uh, talking about the difference between individual donations and grant revenue for a nonprofit. Um, Starts out by saying in fundraising, generally, individual donations are considered the holy grail of money and grants are the fool's gold because if you're going for a grant, generally has a short lifespan and you have to designate it and use it for one specific item or project, whereas individual donations, often you can spend the money more flexibly. And this is the typical thinking of how nonprofits have functioned. This article kind of throws a wrench in that, which I thought was interesting because they talked about some metrics, which which accountant doesn't love some metrics, right? In 2019, Grant funding easily surpassed $862 billion, more than double the $309 billion donated by private citizens. So if you're an organization and you are looking for funds, it seems that by this metric, you have more than twice the amount of money out there available to your specific organization if you go the grant route. Um, And this article also kind of points out that the way we treat people who are looking for grants or who are grant writers is not equal to the to the way we treat somebody higher up in a development department. The pay is lower for a grant writer, and it's not seen as the highest echelon of a development department, even though it can be a real source of income and, and can sustain you for a long time if you have these grants that can recur every year, which a lot of government grants do. And there are a lot of foundations that will donate yearly if you're keeping a specific project or program moving forward. This was a little bit of a different way of thinking about grants for me. And and I could, I could definitely see how the author was bringing me around to that conclusion. But I, I'm curious if either, either of you had a similar conclusion. Well, I just want to thank the author because somebody finally came around to the way I think about funding for a nonprofit. And I'm always usually grant forward, you know, I guess is like the way to put it because I really feel like grants are just like a donation. You, you build a, re, a rapport and a reputation with a grantor and it makes it much easier to get a reoccurring uh, grant. For instance, let's use a state or city uh, fund that's granting you money to help their constituents or the, the populace in their, in their area. If you're providing a service that they know is being rendered correctly, it's much easier to go back to them year, you know, after that first grant is done and get grant two, three, or four to continue that program. Now, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and be fully funded and have all your operations run through, run through one county or one grant. But what I'm saying is, is it's not, uh, you know, it's not so different from donation cultivation. Grant cultivation is a real thing. And you get a reputation and, and, a, and, a, and a comfortability with somebody that's granting you money and you're able to report the, you know, response or the, the uh, people affected to it on a timely basis. You're able to give them good financial reports on time and they're funding your and they're funding that program for you. I think it's a very good vehicle for nonprofits to be able to. And often I've heard and I've been on the board of some small like museums or nonprofits where they don't want to chase grants at all. 
because they think it's, you know, kind of a fool's errand because they're so small. And I would say that, you know, it doesn't hurt trying, I guess, you know, and, and I understand that the grant writing process can be intense and arduous, but I think the other side of that is if you get one of these relationships with grantors and they're on board with what you're doing and how you're doing it, it makes it very easy for you to continue that grant relationship after that grant is finished. And it can be a good stable source of income for years and years to come if if managed correctly. So I, I would implore nonprofits to think more about nonpro- about grants and not just going after donations and bequests from individuals. Yeah. And so I always encourage people to diversify and to be able to do, you know, you have your portfolio be donor kind of unrestricted type of cash. Sometimes for some agencies, that's actually harder to obtain and, and to get. And so they they rely solely on grants because there's a process in a way, and, and especially if they're providing services, there's it could be easier for them to get. On the flip side, those who are heavily reliant um, on grants, then I would say that they need to start looking at ways to increase their fundraising or ways to you know get other sources of don- donations and, and contributions. Um, but I would also say if you are a organization that only gets the, those types of cash donations, that a grant could be a great way to supplement. So you are in a way to diversifying your revenue source, because at the end of the day, both sides can be difficult to manage and to obtain. Um, I will say that when people are going forward and trying to increase their, their grants to really have an effective grant writer is, is helpful. Um, and it is interesting to, to see that they're, you know, in, in typically paid less, even though like what AJ just said, the process of actually applying for a grant and being a grant writer can be actually a lot more difficult and uh, time consuming. So you want to make sure you have the right skills um, set in place to ensure that you can get that. And I think also really reviewing the grant once it's rewarded and understanding what what the reporting requirements are, what the um, any other type of restrictions and or conditions that you have to get while you're doing that really does bring a little bit more play in the, the time invested. Because I think sometimes, which is why some nonprofits may not want to do the grant, is that they're a little bit not, they aren't sure what they're going to be looking at or looking for. And there are some requirements that they need to really be aware of and looking at that when they're receiving that. But it is a great way to to get that resource and that uh, and those those types of funds and to support an organization. Yeah, and I think kind of when you when you start the road of going towards grant funding, it's almost like when you're fresh out of high school and you want to start obtaining credit, right? Nobody wants to give you credit because you don't have any credit. Similarly, I've worked with organizations where they're going for grants, and the grantors will often ask, "Well, what other grants have you gotten?" And it's like. Well, nothing yet. I'm, I'm just trying. And then they just keep throwing darts at the wall, hoping something will stick until it eventually does. And I think that often disheartens smaller nonprofits because they're like, we're perfect for this grant. And then they try it and they don't get it. They try the next one, they don't get it. But if you keep at it, and like Tammy was saying, if you, if you find the, the grant writer who has success and a track record in getting these kind of grants, and like AJ was saying, you know, sky's the limit on, on some of these grants that just keep on going on. So I think it's I think it's a really rich field that will, I'm sure, mine more of in, in the coming weeks. Tammy, you've got an article for us. I do. So I have an article from DonorBox titled How Story Storytelling Increases Trust in Your Nonprofit. So in previous podcasts, we've discussed the high value that donors place on trust when donating to an organization. We've even shared some articles about building trust on websites and how sharing financial reports or measurements can aid in building trust. This article actually takes a different spin, and it states that the street donations remain uh, to be the most popular way of donating. However, online donations are gaining ground as the dominant channel. So this can actually be a bit challenging for nonprofits as one of the biggest issues that organizations are facing in 2021 is increasing visibility online. In addition to that, the article states that with the overwhelming number of new charities popping up, um, people are actually losing trust in them. And this could be due to kind of the intrusive ads that we're seeing online or emails from unknown own seeking donations for a really good cause that you'd never heard about before. Um, but the article says that by sharing, you know, financial data is a good place to start, that more people are actually drawn to stories than they are to numbers. 
And a good story can communicate the organization's impact in a fast and compelling way. The article suggests the following five steps in crafting a story. One, uh, find people who can be the hero of the story. Uh, two, show what problems they are facing. Three, tell how they you know handle these problems. Four, show how you uh, your your help or your organization is helping um, those matters in their journey. And then uh, five, create a sense of unity. So the article provided a lot of tips in developing a story and demonstrates how people connect with story t- storytelling rather than data. I, of course, like both. I love numbers. I do love stories as well. But I wanted to get your thoughts on how, you know, this article kind of, you know, as you read it, how you guys thought about it. And then if there's other ways that nonprofits can really increase visibility and trust. Yeah, the the article really resonated with me because, and I didn't realize it until I was reading the article, but some of the most successful, I guess, I I guess you can call it campaigning, you know, or campaigns for donations or whatever involved kind of this storytelling, like there's a short film or so, you know, uh, storytelling in the, in the way of presenting the impact that this nonprofit has. I think if you can, you know, like get to somebody's emotions on how, how this, how this organization and how their program has really affected the greater community or uh, the affected mm-hmm. people that they're trying to serve. That's much better than showing them, Hey, we spent 90 cents on your dollar on programs. Well, what programs, you know, like, I think, you know, th- there's a, so- I think there's a time and place for that kind of out- analysis, but I would say that like, the impact, and we've talked about it on this podcast before, the impact and the, 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 I guess, the outcome of your donation or donations in a way or grants is much more of a story and a, and a talking point and, and a hook to bring somebody into the organization in this community um, rather than just a financial report. And I think it's a big reason why you see more and more nonprofits moving towards like the annual report than just providing their, their financials on, on, on their website, you know, an audited financial statement, unless you're adept at reading nonprofit financials, there's not much of a story there unless you have somebody to lead you down that path and, and explain it to you. So weaving the financials into like an annual report and telling that story as a way of doing that, but even more impactful is a video presentation or a short film. And the best ones that I have seen don't even have an ask in them. They're providing the information free out there and people just get excited and, and, and enticed and want to know how they can help either financially or volunteer wise to be able to help with that awesome story and, and video that I just saw. So I'd say if you're a nonprofit out there listening and you're thinking about storytelling, I would say do it unselfishly without an ask even. And, and then you can follow up once you've created that engagement. I think you can really follow up and engage with an ask later, but I think it would drive, you know, the ask, you know, more, organically, I guess, to use a catchphrase that's, you know, probably overly used these days, but it would be an organic cultivation from just telling your story. Yeah, I I, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with this concept. Um, and I really do agree that a good story can really drive engagement and drive donors to your door. But I think for me, the key is genuineness, right? Because you have organizations who might read this article and say, okay, let's find our story that we can tell so that we can make some money or bring in some donations. And to me, you know, having, having come off this past presidential election, both sides, anytime a politician gets up there and talks about, well, my friend so-and-so, who's just some random citizen that fits into the narrative of the point they're trying to prove, It just, I'm immediately turned off by it because there's no genuine nature to it. So I think storytelling can be super impactful and super important, but if you're just creating a story or, you know, coming up with somebody that doesn't really fit the mission or doesn't, doesn't speak to you personally, but you're just putting them out there because this is what you're supposed to do. It's not going to work because you're going to have people who see right through it. So Yes, I think it's super a super impactful way of doing it, but don't do it casually. Don't do it lightly because then you're going to, you know, if you come out with a new story every month of a new person and people are just getting inundated with this, they're not connecting anymore. So, you know, 
yes, try it, but try it with genuineness, I guess would be my take. And I think I would add to that too, Mark, because those are all good points. As the other thing too is know your audience. And we've been saying this quite a bit in the last few podcasts, but really know who you're trying to attract and donate because I, and to some story is all they want to hear. And that's great. And they want to hear, you know, 5,000 stories and all this kind of stuff more is, is better in that sense. But then there are also people who want a story with some, you know, data and some numbers or the ask within the story. And there are some that just want the data and the numbers. And there's all these kind of various different ways to go about it. And the thing that in terms of crafting any message, which is, you know, a podcast that we did not too long ago was understanding what you're trying to say and what you're trying to ask and who are you asking and who are you sharing this message with? Because that all plays into, you know, the, the storytelling per se um, of what you're doing is to really understand what you're, you know, who you're talking to, because some people are going to be turned off by a storytelling or some people might say, Oh, I heard this before, or this doesn't seem real. And all that kind of stuff is that you really have to understand who your audience is and how they're going to interpret the storytelling or the data, data presenting or any of those things, how they're going to interpret it is going to be key to any message that you want to share. Yeah. And I would say one, one quote from this article that really got under my skin Humans did not evolve to understand mathematics and graphs. Mm -mm. Not buying it. (laughs) Jay, you got another article for us? Trying to get over my anger over that last sentence. But yeah, Um, anyway. (laughs) Uh, My article is actually from The Giving Review, and it's called Digital Dollars and Donor Demands. So the article, it's pretty a short read, but it's uh, from a gentleman that has a lot of experience in it. So the opening statement is, imagine smart money. Imagine, imagine programmable money, Georgetown University uh, professor Jim Angel said. Um, what he's talking about is when giving, there's, there, we're on the precipice of being able to track penny for penny when you donate a dollar and when digital funds are given, um, if you earmark them for something to actually see where that money is spent. And I think, you know, as it, as it comes out, as it comes out of my mouth, it sounds like a great idea, but he's proposing the opposite. He's saying um, that not only would it, uh, it, you know, not only would it be onerous to the tracking of that money, especially if we're talking like if you get $50 and like Bitcoin or something tracking how that's spent, you know, through it, uh, let alone how a, how a nonprofit would then turn Bitcoin into some real cash that they could spend on a program. Uh, it also says that uh, implications of it would trample upon the trust that's built in a nonprofit. And you wouldn't be giving and trusting that this nonprofit that you have a relationship with is using the money correctly, but that you are then, you know, checking the receipts, so to say, of that nonprofit to ensure that that money was spent correctly. And so, there's so many reporting mechanisms in a nonprofit. I think, you know, and and as a if you're a major donor and you want to see your, where your money's going, I think there's more avenues than tracking every penny digitally that you give to them. But this could be an inevitability and kind of something that we're moving towards. So I'd kind of like to get the panel's, you know, take on whether or not you think this is maybe just a pie in the sky idea or if this is on its way and and whether or not you think it would be advantageous or detrimental to uh, donations that are made to a nonprofit. Yeah, I think I think I agree with this conclusion because the whole idea of tracking every penny does seem to bring into question as to whether you can trust the organization. And I know just like features on the iPhone, like, you know, track my iPhone where family members have real issues around. They can see me wherever I'm at, wherever I go around town. There's, there's a push pull with that where some people are like, well, for safety purposes, it makes total sense, but for privacy purposes and trust purposes, it falls apart completely. So while there may be some numerical benefits to this, you know, it it does feel like it's an invasion of the trust. And if you can't trust the organization enough to donate to them and then see the results without micromanaging how they're spending the money, then maybe they're not the organization for you. The other just side note I would point out, I, I encourage everybody to follow the link in the YouTube and read this article because this author has not met an alliteration he didn't like. So <laughs> what, is, what are your thoughts, Danny? Uh, I was on the same page with you guys. I mean, at the end, and I say this a lot, at the end of the day, um, it's all about trust. 
I mean, that's what we're talking about. And then this particular tracking digitally after you've donated is kind of getting the sense of, oh, my money did go where I wanted to. But I would say that even before that the money is received, the actual decision to give money is where the trust needs to be built. And maybe you could say, yeah, you know, once you give us money, we can you know show you exactly where it goes down to the penny. People might be inspired to give by that. But I would definitely say that if you can build trust first and be able to you know get people to want to help your your charity or your cause or organization, that that would go probably a longer way than this micromanaging of down to the penny type of, of situation. Um, plus, I mean, I don't think the article stressed enough about how much time consuming or, you know, time that would take to do that type of tracking as well as the cost of what, you know, if that is a software or website or whatever that may be, that, you know, do organizations, you know, can they afford to expend that amount of money for this type of tracking solution? I don't know, but it does seem like a lot of effort on the back end where I would encourage folks to really think about the trust building that you can do in the beginning in order to get someone who wants to contribute and, and to your organization. And then my other thought, it, my, my thought was when, when I was reading the article too, is and something that the article doesn't get into, but what happens when it's not spent the way you want it spent, you know, are you going to pull back? Are you going to charge back your $50 donation or hundred dollar donation? I mean, again, the cost mount, you know, and you would be pulling um, a revenue out of a nonprofit, which the, you know, it's not really Robin Hood. It's like the opposite, you know? So I think, I think, yeah, thinking this through, I mean, it's like, like anything like rotating auditors or something sounds like a good idea on the face of it. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, it's, it, is it really a good decision? And is it right for your organization to have this kind of setup? Um, I think the art, I think the article and the author makes a good case that it shouldn't be. And I think we did too. So Mark, do you have our uh, budget discussion for this week? You bet. Uh, the topic that we teased last week that we want to talk about this week is a capital campaign budget. So capital campaigns generally are these larger projects that your organization undertakes in order to build or create something larger that's going to last. And it the capital campaign, let me give you an example. Like, let's say a school might have a capital campaign to build a new building that then they might auction off a donor name to put on the building, depending on how much money is given. But generally, these campaigns tend to stretch out for a longer period of time. They're definitely in higher dollar figures, and they come with some, some form of super... Uh, fundraising effort that needs to happen in order to get them moving. So in order to do a capital campaign budget, you're going to A, need to figure out what the organization wants to do. You're going to need to see if there's enough excitement to, to even warrant that. And often that might come from a survey or some sort of study to see if this is even a feasible enterprise to undertake. But then you're going to have to start thinking about all the costs and the fundraising that is that is associated with that. So fundraising costs is a big one, right? Because if you're doing a capital campaign, you're going to probably have to try to reach people who are not familiar with your organization or who haven't contributed in a way that, that you've asked them to contribute before. You're asking for a bigger ask. You're asking for them to commit and have some ownership in this new capital campaign. Um, Timing is a huge one, right? Is this capital campaign only going to take a year? Is this a three-year project? Are you raising money in tranches where you're having to figure out, you know, phase one is this, phase two is this? And what happens if you don't raise enough money to complete phase two? Are you just calling the capital campaign a success because you completed the campaign? Other factors to really consider, right, is that are you going to be starting to cannibalize, if you will, your own operations and your own regular budget by having a capital campaign. Because if I'm a donor and I give a thousand bucks every year and it goes into an unrestricted operational fund, but I decide, oh, that capital campaign sounds really exciting. I'll give $500 to that and 500 to operations. They're giving the same amount of money, but yet now you are having to figure out where to make the shortfall in your normal operating budget. So there's there's a rich minefield of lots of things to consider when you're looking into the capital campaign 
and what to include in it. And let's take another example, say staff salaries. If I have people that are getting paid to do work and they're busy full time, but then I'm assigning them to the capital campaign to work 20% of their time, are we moving costs from operations into the capital campaign? There's a lot of manipulation and, and factors that need to be considered when you undertake this. And, you know, it's a, it's a big time commitment, but it can also be very rewarding. So I'm curious what your overall thoughts are on a capital campaign in general and the budget in particular. Uh, so I've actually been a part of a capital campaign and um, it's as painful as it sounds um, and in the intro there. And I think the first thing that really, and we've talked, we've done articles on this podcast before that people can go back and listen to, but I think the first place to start and really before you, you know, like as you're putting together this budget of what it would take to accomplish this capital campaign. Um, well, I think let me back up. The first place to start is to realize you need a capital campaign. So we're not talking about replacing, you know, a couple computers or a, or a fleet vehicle or a new roof on the on the on the on the organization. We're talking about large expenditures, usually in the seven digits. You know, we're talking a million up, probably for uh, what you need. It doesn't mean you couldn't have a capital campaign for a new roof. I'm just saying, you, normally it's usually a new building, a new piece of land, a new another, you know, sub uh, campus of what you're doing or something. So it's usually large numbers and you need to be able to know that the community and your, in your donation base is able to support, or, you know, the community at large is able to support this type of, of, of campaign. And we've talked about it and done articles on the podcast before about doing a feasibility study. So I would say that is a number one, the place you need to start and, you would have to budget for that feasibility study. They're not cheap. You know, we're talking probably 10 grand somewhere around or more, <clears throat> but that's a probably good, you know, finger in the wind starting point. And then, you know, the other things that you really need to consider, like Mark said, is who's going to be manning this? There's a, a capital campaign is a large undertaking and it is going to absorb, you know, your other programs and you're going to have to put, you know, any kind of other donations and stuff such that you have resources pulled to are probably going to be pulled away from the current resources they're in and be doubled down on and you know moved over to this capital campaign so being able to suss that out of your normal operating budget and create a a, a capital campaign budget like this is it's a lot of work and i would just caution everybody out there, you know, that is thinking about this, that they need to take a long, hard look at what it's going to take and really crunch those numbers and get that underneath before they, before they even ask for their first donation. Yeah. So I echo all the things that you guys are saying at the, you know, when we're looking at this um, campaigns, you know, they should have a study beforehand. They obviously should have a budget. Anytime you're thinking about something that's a big ask, or that's going to take a lot of time and investment from an from an organization to even start and move forward, one should then always think of, yes, that probably means that there's a budget involved. There's going to make sure things are kind of going to plan because you have to plan for these things because they're huge investment in terms of time resources. And they're also a huge gain is assuming that the campaign goes well. So I would definitely encourage the the idea of the of the budget and and I just like once you develop it, but then also tracking against it, especially if it's a multi year campaign. How are you doing in year one, year two, year three? Are you you know achieving the goals that you wanted to or what you had set out? Are there things that can be changed or looked at differently to move it in a better direction? I think all those things need to kind of come into play when you're dealing with a capital campaign. Um, the other thing that I was going to add too is, you know, there's, I have an organization that I receive mail, you know, at least two, two three times a year. They're, they're always doing a campaign. And the thing that's interesting to me, it's like, well, to Mark's point earlier, a donor, like when I see that, I say that they have multiple campaigns, I then end up saying, okay, well, I'm going to split my normal donations and do a campaign A, B, three, or C. And then sometimes I'll say, I'm done with the campaign because there's, there are always, there's too many campaigns from this one organization. I'm not kidding you there. I receive something every year regarding a new campaign that they, that has been established. And I'm like, I'm kind of over for it because it seems like that's a lot of effort. And I kind of then would say, here, I'll give you general money. You, you decide where to use it. But that goes back to properly planning property, properly budgeting, and then also knowing who your donor 
are, or, you know, who, who, what they want to kind of contribute to. So it's a big undertaking. And I think that I wouldn't, you know, say don't do it, but I would say ensure that you invest the time to ensure that you're doing it correctly. That conversation was capital. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode of Profitless on Purpose, the nonprofit focus accounting podcast. Please hit the like and subscribe buttons if you're watching this on YouTube or rate us on your favorite podcast app. Check us out on Twitter at Profitless Pod. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you. And until next time, have a great day. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.